this computer. All right, uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, engineers and uh, uh, esteemed students of engineering profession. Uh, this afternoon, we, we are happy to have our presenter, uh, Dr. Lillian Jaggi, a medical doctor, infectious diseases uh, specialist at Nairobi University. So, uh, as usual, it's, uh, it's wonderful and uh, an opportunity and a blessing to be able to host uh, this webinar together with uh, Diana Wadanji. So at this moment, I'll just allow um, my other co-host, uh, Engineer Grace Kagondu, to, in, uh, to, to say something before uh, Engineer Lillian, uh, Dr. Uh, Lillian comes in. Engineer? Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Engineer Dolo. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to welcome uh, all our members and all other engineers watching this uh, webinar this afternoon. Uh, to welcome them to this uh, webinar and um, which has been put together of course by the IEK, the Institute of Engineers of Kenya, uh, as a response to the many uh, requests from the engineers and the general engineering fraternity. I think I would like to take this opportunity first and foremost to uh, appreciate and say thank you very much to engineer Kathy Muni, who was the one who actually uh, reached out to Dr. Lillian Jagi. As uh, because she, uh, we asked her to get her as a doctor who can help us uh, host this webinar, and she was able to get us uh, Dr. Lynn and Jagi. So, thank you very much, Engineer Catherine Muni, uh, for supporting the IEK. Uh, now, I think I would like to move on quickly to uh, say a few words on behalf of the IEK Council. As you recall, uh, during the AGM of 9th of April 2020, the president of IEK, Engineer Nathaniel Matalanga, launched the COVID-19 CSR initiative of IEK, uh, which we dubbed the IEK COVID-19 Response Fund. And he explained that the aim was to lend our support collectively as a fraternity of engineers in the fight against COVID-19. Uh, now, uh, the reason why we are doing this, number one, is because we want to show our solidarity with Kenyans, our community and our society, during this trying time of a very brutal pandemic, a scale which we have never seen before. So it is a time for us to demonstrate to the public that uh, engineers are concerned about the situation and they have taken a stand to take action. We are committing to offering our financial resources and our talents in fighting the scourge. Uh, number two is uh, we also want to create more awareness about IEK and what we stand for. We are about positive impact on society and we want to have, and we want to, uh, have many lives changed for the better by our effort and our sacrifice in this particular CSR initiative. Uh, now, I think I would like to just go very briefly about what it is that we want to do in this uh, CSR initiative. And this is based on the suggestions that came from members uh, across the engineering fraternity, including from IEK. Number one, we want to provide uh, personal protective equipment to those in the front line, the medics, the patients, and also our communities. We also want to support uh, by providing fumigation and disinfection services. We want to provide water and clean tanks to those vulnerable communities who, which do not have access to these facilities. And we also want to provide survival kits for vulnerable families. families. These survival kits uh, comprise foods and other basic requirements. Uh, at the same time, we want to support innovations from our engineering schools. You have all heard in the media that we have got uh, the Dankemathi University and also Kenyatta University have um, been able to innovate some equipment, ventilators, and even sanitizers and other um, kind of um, aids that can help in this pandemic, in fighting the pandemic. So we want to reach out to these uh, universities because they are uh, their engineering schools and see how we can support them. We are already in contact with the Kenyatta University. And uh, just yesterday, I was talking to the group that uh, is uh, at Gearbox who are doing, who have got a, a team from University of Nairobi also. And they are working very, very hard in uh, developing ventilators. And actually those ventilators uh, look very really good. They look almost as good as the ones we are seeing on the, on, the, on the internet. 
And I think uh, with, with our support, they should be able to come up some, with something that can work even for us here in the country and maybe even the rest of Africa. And uh, we also want to, to support uh, by providing technical assistance, drawing on our very unique uh, talents and, and skill sets. As you're aware, the government has proposed schools in every country, in every county to be isolation centers. These areas will need adequate, will need adequate um, facilities such as uh, uh, sanitation, safe ma medical disposal facilities, remodeling of existing buildings, efficient access among others. So, excuse me. Yeah, so we want to be able to support that. Therefore, we are appealing to all our members to come forward and volunteer their services. A portal has been set up on the IEK website uh, for the, uh, the COVID-19 CSR, where you can get the MPESA pay bill number to send your contribution. The target is to raise uh, 10 million. That is what we are targeting, and that is what the president uh, mentioned in the AGM. And uh, we want to, we are proposing to allocate uh, maybe uh, 3 million for PPEs, uh, 1 million for fumigation, sterilization, um, maybe 3 million for water tanks, and 2.5 million for survival kits, and uh, 0 0.5 million for logistics. Uh, now, we are requesting you to please send your contributions to, to MPESA pay bill number 976. You can see it there on the screen. 976. 295 and uh, the account number will be your membership number and then dash cov19 or you can put your name cov19 you will see the flyers for the csr drives on the website and also on the social media platforms please help us to share widely and uh, keep tweeting and publicizing uh, on behalf of council i thank you very much uh, to all those who have contributed so far we have raised, um, let me tell you the figure, we have raised so much, we have raised uh, 690,520 as of today. I repeat that, 690,520,000 uh, th Kenya shillings as of today. And every day we'll be providing updates on the IEK website. So keep tracking and keep following on how much we have raised on, us, on a daily basis. And we have also created a meter that will be showing how much we have raised. And the, the meter is shown there on the screen. So once again, thank you uh, very much to the past and the present council and the, and the secretariat team for the cooperation. And uh, to all of you, uh, may each of you be blessed abundantly as you support us with your contribution. Please support your the IK uh, CSR COVID fund. Thank you very much. Uh, so now, um, Engineer Andolo, I think that is a contribution. That is the, the opening remarks I wanted to, to make. So please uh, take on. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Grace. And uh, I would just like to remind uh, those who are uh, not members of engineers, uh, engineers uh, institution, that their contribution can be received by just if you don't because they don't have membership number, they can just put their name and write uh, COVID COV nineteen the way the, the way it is shown on the on, on the screen there. Otherwise, uh, Diana, if you have anything, I would uh, like to you to, to uh, invite our guest now. Thank you, Engineer Dalla. Thank you, Engineer Grace, for such a comprehensive welcome note. So at this point, I would want to welcome Dr. Lillian. I can see some council members who are here, like Engineer Lucy, who's the first VP. I think you'll be speaking after, after the presentation. So uh, at this point, point we would want to welcome Dr. Lillian. You had sent on your questions on the Google form and the concerns that you had that we also shared with her. We really want to know what this COVID-19 is, what, what it looks like. Is it something that if I get, I can get well? There has been a lot of panic. Nowadays, personally, I don't sneeze at peace because I'll sneeze and think, oh my God, do I have COVID now? So there's a lot of panic going around and uh, yeah, please address that. And now how it affects us as professionals in this space. Karibu Dr. Lillian and thank you for your time. Also, thank you to Engineer Kadi Muni for connecting us with you. Karibu. Mm. 
Dr. Lillian. Okay, Ndolo, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Dr. Ari? Do Dr. Lillian? Uh, Let me the, give her a call. The sound on our side, that, she's there. Dr. Yeah. Ari, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, the house, uh, mom, Brenna, can, can you get in touch with the... And, Okay, let me give her a call and see what's up. Yeah, and if she has she has a headset, uh, she can use the headset. Maybe uh, because the sound is bouncing and there's an echo, I can hear some echo from her side. Yeah, she's back. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, doctor, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Sorry, I could hear you guys quite well. Uh, right. Uh, now it's we we we. It's now your time to uh, give a presentation on the guidelines that you are, we had sent you earlier, and uh, from your professional point of view, also teach us mm -hmm. a bit about uh, COVID uh, or as or rather um, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, COVID-19, mm -hmm. the disease. Welcome, Doctor. You have something to share? I will stop that uh, part. You can continue. Okay. All right. So thank you for having me. Uh, most I'm impressed with the work you're doing from just listening to your introduction. Eh? Doctor, your sound is gone again. She's muted. I'm trying to unmute her. She muted herself. She's a host. she's a co-host. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. All right, Doctor, you don't. I don't... did see the question. Uh, uh, huh. Am I muted? Uh huh. You had I'm muted. Not muted from my end. <clears throat> you had muted yourself, so just. Uh... Oh really? Am I still muted? You can hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't mute. Okay, so... I'll just go ahead with the presentation then. Eh? to complete. Yeah, but I will cover a few of the ones we can be able to cover in a presentation format. So if you want to interrupt me at any point, you feel free to do so. Um, yeah, so. So I'll just move on. Um, so our discussion is on SARS-CoV, COVID-19. And I think one of the first questions I saw is, what is this SARS-CoV and what is COVID-19? It seems there is quite a bit of confusion on what the difference is, and I'll go into that. But before I start, just to tell you what coronaviruses are, because really that's the main, that's what we are talking about here. And uh, it's a large group of viruses which cause respiratory illnesses. And respiratory, we mean the nose, ears, throat, lungs, which you know, medically we call as upper and lower respiratory system. So coronaviruses are a group of viruses, and there are many other viruses that cause these, what we commonly call flus and colds and chest infections. Eh? Now, coronaviruses were first isolated in the 1960s, and they are divided into various groups. You know, uh, the four groups are the most common, and then below those groups are many, many species. So coronavirus, the one we are discussing is just one of these. They affect both human beings as well as animals. 
for the food will focus on What we know about corona is more uh, epidemic, which is called the global. It didn't become a pandemic. Uh, so before then, it was the usual coronaviruses, which cause flus worldwide in pretty areas. Normally, most of us get these coronaviruses from childhood and you know, develop, keep developing immunity and we get another variant, but your body then clears it all. Okay. And transmission um, and contact, either direct or indirect. Okay. Now in two or three, that was the outbreak of SARS-CoV, which started in two or two to two or three, did not spread much beyond China. And uh, since 2003, since 2004, we haven't had any case of the SARS CoV, and I'll go a bit more into that. Then in 2012, there was another outbreak of a similar virus, which is called MERS CoV, and what this stands for is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. Well, the SARS CoV is, um, we'll go into it in more detail. But what we know is that the MERS CoV. Since 2012, we've had a few outbreaks here and there, but in the Middle East, confined to the Middle East. So a few cases, but then they clear off by themselves. So now what is this SARS-CoV? What is SARS-CoV-2 and what is COVID-19? So the first outbreak of SARS-CoV was in 2002. Uh, ending in 2003, the last, last case being reported in 2002. Um, and just to tell you what this is, these are the abbreviations, what I've highlighted, given the name, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Navira. <laughs> Doctor, uh, just a minute. Uh, it seems your internet is uh, uh, poor. Very poor. It keeps you keep on breaking. Your... Itself is a coronavirus the syndrome, and that's big. We see. Uh, Doctor's internet is poor, so we will allow her to come back. She's uh, she has gone off the radar. Let me see. I if I can get her on call. I think you have a problem. The sound is very poor. It's uh, yeah. The sound is the the, the, the network is very bad. Doctor, are you there? You are just a minute. <clears throat> And also the buffering uh, from my end is very, very loud. I don't know that you are also hearing the same. Sorry? Are you also I hearing have... that buffering? Not really. From my end, no. Yeah, now, now I'm hearing it. Can you hear me? I've changed internet, so I'm not sure how that sounds now. It's better. Uh, what, inter what internet are you using, Dr. Terry? Mm -hmm. Uh, Safari comes, so I've just on the phone. Yeah, I, ho I hope nobody will call you when we are talking. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I have changed to a wireless, so I was then I changed to the phone, which didn't work well, so I've changed back to the wireless, which had gone off. So I All hope right. that will be stable enough. 
All right, uh, all right. Then you can now start. Uh, you can continue with your slides, please. Okay, sorry. Let me just share the screen once again. So we can go back at that point. Yeah, but can you can so you just can can you uh, start the slides? Start the slides so that they are they, from the can, beginning. No, no, no. We we can see that they like make it whole, whole screen like playing it rather. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Sorry. Oh. that yeah, yeah that way that's better that's better okay but you continue where we left yes okay so i'll go into what the difference between SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 is eh? which is i think one of the first questions that was asked uh and the word SARS-CoV first came in 2002 the name SARS-CoV which is the name of the virus which was implicated to have caused the outbreak in China in 2002-2003, with the last case being documented in 2004, um, and no case since then. The virus is, has been designated the name Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus. So the COV is a short form for coronavirus, an acronym for coronavirus. Uh, then SARS is derived from the word severe, meaning, you know, it gets severe, acute of sudden onset. Respiratory talks about our lungs, our, our breathing system. Then syndrome usually talks about a number of symptoms coming all together, you know, not just one symptom, but a number of symptoms presenting, yeah, in which case we are initially not sure what is causing. So that's where the word SARS came from. And so it was called the SARS-CoV virus, which caused the SARS-CoV disease outbreak of 2002. This virus was less efficient in its transmission, which explains why it didn't become a pandemic. And it was easier to control and contain because of the less transmission, although there was a higher mortality. Uh, although for now, that's based on the current statistics, but we don't know how this disease will evolve as we are going on. What we know is that the mortality rate approached 10% for the SARS-CoV. Uh, for the current COVID, we've been below five, but looking at the data today, we are at around 6% of mortality. So we are waiting to see how that happens. Now, COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19, you know, when we talk about HIV AIDS, which is the one most people understand, is that AIDS is the illness the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, which is caused by um, HIV. HIV, which is Human Immunodeficiency Syndrome. So if you think of it like that, you will then understand that COVID is an acronym for now what we are calling the disease, like AIDS. The equivalent of AIDS in this case is COVID, which means Coronavirus Disease of 2019. And the reason we, we say that is because, as you've seen, there have been many coronaviruses. There are the coronaviruses which caused the common cold. Then there was the coronavirus which caused the SARS outbreak in 2003. Then there was the coronavirus against Spain which caused the Middle East respiratory syndrome. Then now there's a new strain of the coronavirus which scientists had to try and identify what is it. So at First, it was then called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. And the reason for this is from looking at the, at the genetic makeup and seeing that it, has a, it, had a high very, it had a high resemblance to the SARS-CoV of 2 or 3. So the genetic makeup is still remaining very, not 100%, but it's very similar, over 90% a close relative of the SARS outbreak of two or three. So that's why the virus has been given the same name, but with a two to show that it's the second one. Okay. Uh, now that is the virus. And then, you know, as early on in January, it was then thought, it was then given the name of 2019 novel coronavirus. Novel new, so it's a new coronavirus, which was in 2019. Uh, then towards the end of beginning of March around there, WHO then decided to coin it Coronavirus Disease 
of 2019, you know, to be able to differentiate it from the SARS-CoV disease. So I hope that now clears it. So the disease is then coronavirus disease, which is for 2019, first reported in 2019, November, uh, and the virus causing it is the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, the second one to differentiate it from the one of um, the SARS of 2003, which are similar but a little different. So one is the disease, the other one is the virus causing it. So now we can go to the virus, the SARS-2 causing the COVID disease, or the COVID-19 disease. So what is currently known, first we all know now, it, was, it started in Wuhan, China, and the initial cases were linked to the seafood market, which was then closed, sterilized, uh, but then the cases continued to spread. Uh, it's caused by the SARS-CoV virus, too, as we have uh, said. By 11th of January, China had already now looked at the genetic sequence and they knew what the virus was. And that's how they were able to link this genetic sequence to the previous SARS, but then say that it's a little different, not exactly the same. Hence, it was given the name SARS-CoV-2. So it causes a number of respiratory disease, ranging from very mild to very severe. And you know, by the current statistics, we actually see that 80% of the diseases are mild. Yeah, with now the remaining 20%, some being slightly severe, and others a small percentage, about four five percent being lethal, being to death. And what we know is that serious medical conditions are leading to a high mortality, as well as uh, the elderly. And we know the elderly also come with other serious medical conditions and lowered immunity. What is not known is where it really came from. It is thought that it came from bats. Uh, some scientists are saying that origin may have been from bats, but then it's passed on through pang pangolins and then to humans. But this is not clearly known. Everything is speculation up until now. Uh, and it, it, it's also not known exactly how easily it spreads between people. Although we know it is definitely spreading faster than the SARS-CoV of uh, 2002 and the MERS. Okay? Although for now, the mortality is slightly lower. Uh, in terms of spread, um, it's thought to mostly spread through person to person. Uh, the roots being first droplets, and we know droplets are the heavy, you know, when you cough, sneeze, or talk, what you spit out, those are heavy droplets that quickly fall to the ground or to any surfaces. And when these droplets get in touch with your mucous membranes, and the mucous membranes are inside your mouth, inside your nose, your eyes. So yes, you can get the transmission into you through your eyes or anywhere where the, there is moist, moisture. Uh, the period of infectivity is not known. And by that, what we mean is, it's, it's, um, we don't know how early someone starts infecting others. But what has been seen is that people who don't have any symptoms have been known to spread. In fact, there was a current study which showed that about 25 to 30% of the people spreading don't even know they have the infection. Yeah. So it's not quite known. That is something that is still evolving. It's also not quite clear how long people continue transmitting, even after that, you know, especially because of the tests we are doing. Does it mean when they turn negative is when the person has stopped spreading or they stop spreading even when the test is still positive? Uh, the risk of transmission varies by the type and the duration of exposure. Uh, and by the type, what we mean is if there is a high amount of secretions and one gets into contact with it, then you're more likely to get the, the um, infection. Then the preventive measures that have been used, for example, someone with a mask is least likely to transmit as opposed to someone without a mask. Then the individual factors, and here we are looking at how high is the viral content, the viral load, we call it the amount of the virus and the person has in secretions, where if these secretions have a very low viral load, and that we can only tell by measuring from the lab, then they are more likely to be infectious. For environmental contamination, it's not quite known how long SARS-CoV-2 can persist on surfaces, 
what is known is that all the other coronaviruses can persist on the surface for six to nine hours, which is quite long. So if this follows the same trend, then it means the surface, our surfaces can retain this virus for that long, and so it can continue transmitting for that long. In terms of animal contact, what has been shown is that humans are now transmitting the infection to their pets, and mostly it is cats. And when cats get infected, they become <coughs> symptomatic, but there hasn't been any proven case of now cats infecting humans again but it's known that humans are infecting their pets, especially cats. Uh, from experiments, it's also, it's also showing that it's possible to infect dogs, but dogs are, are, remain, are remaining asymptomatic. And they are also, you, there's also evidence that humans can infect dogs, but, but we don't know anything about domestic animals then transmitting to humans. So when someone has an infection, then it's... Um, keep their pets away from them otherwise they're also going to be infected and especially for cats which become symptomatic. Uh, these are the symptoms we mostly expect. 90% of the patients develop fever but not, not, not everybody who has uh, COVID will have fever so you'll still have a small proportion with the infection and without fever some even developing severe disease and developing fever much later than you expect. But of all the symptoms, it's the most common symptom, uh, fever. Then this followed by fatigue, which really is, is a word to mean feeling tired, uh, dry cough. Uh, most people develop poor appetite, then muscle aches, difficulty in breathing, then they start producing sputum. And these symptoms have, have arranged in order of how frequently they occur. Uh, how do we confirm the infection with those symptoms? I mean, anybody who develops those symptoms and uh, is known or knows themselves to have had contact with somebody who is infected, or if one is a health or if one has traveled recently, uh, then a test needs to be done. And the tests we are doing are currently, they are called molecular tests, which look really at the, um, for, the, for this virus, it's called RNA. For our cells, what our cells have is the DNA, the dioxin nucleic acid. But for the viruses, it's an RNA, ribonucleic acid. So what the molecular uh, tests, which are, reverse transcriptional polymerase chain reaction test, they look at the ribonucleic acids of the virus. And a positive test will generally confirm that someone has the infection. We have reported a few false positives. They are posi possible. Uh, then false negatives have also been documented. But what has been seen with the false negatives is that they come from secretions when we get secretions from the upper airway, for example, the nose, that's when you're more likely to get negative um, tests. So what we recommend is if somebody has symptoms and you, high, you highly suspect that they have coronavirus, they need to repeat the test, but with a different sample. And the sample should preferably be taken from the lower airway, that you know, closer to the lungs as opposed to the upper airway, which is the nose and the throat. 90% uh, of mild cases, when you repeat the test after a duration of treatment or even without treatment, by day 12, most tests are turning negative, which for us could mean that they are clearing infection by day 12. However, what has been known is that most severe cases are staying positive for longer some even up to three weeks, but most of the severe cases have been known to recover by the third week with the mild cases, most of them having recovered latest within the second week. Uh, so the other thing we are not sure of is that when you do this test and it's positive, say two weeks after treatment, does it necessarily mean someone is infectious? And it doesn't necessarily mean that because molecular methods are looking at the nucleic acid and it can be a dead organism. You're just picking the genetic material from a dead organism. 
So it may not necessarily mean that if a test is positive, that someone is still infectious. The only way to tell if someone is infectious is to do a culture, which means you try and grow the virus. But we are currently not doing that because, again, of course, there is the risk of growing the virus and it reinfecting the people who are handling it. Eh? Uh, but then also in this emergency setup, culturing a virus takes quite some time. So we'd rather use the resources in looking at tests where we can quickly get the results at a lower risk. So using the test, then we may not use it so much to monitor response to treatment. What we are using to monitor response to treatment is how the person is responding. That said, we still repeat the tests as the patient is undergoing treatment to see at what point it is turning negative. Now, someone asked how long it's taking to get the results. It ranges anywhere from two hours to one week. That looks a very broad range. Uh, but the molecular test itself gives results within two hours. The issue is the logistics between sample collection, for example, if someone is out of Nairobi with the transportation of the sample, uh, then, you know, we've just started doing the test in the various labs. So the national lab is quite overwhelmed, but they are trying their best. So at the beginning, it was taking as long as a week. The time limits are getting shorter and shorter as more and more labs are now starting to do the test. We know now Camry has gotten funding. The university is also starting to do the test. So the timings will get shorter as we go along. Uh, someone asked the role of community testing. It's very important, as you've seen, South Africa has already started doing community testing because that's the only way we can tell how many cases do we actually have. Uh, for example, in Kenya, when we say we have 200 cases, are we sure that is all we have? Uh, remember, we've said 20 to 30 percent of patients may have the infection but not, and transmit it, but they are not symptomatic. So it is possible that we have people out there in the community who don't have the infection, sorry, who have the infection, but they don't have any symptoms. So we are not able to tell the actual number of people so that we can be able to tell how much community transmission is ongoing. So it is important, but we are limited by the resources. Uh, for now, the closest to community test is the contact tracing that you have heard of. And contact tracing has been done for years, especially in regards to HIV. And other all infectious diseases, basically, when there's an outbreak, you want to get anybody who's been in contact with that person because they're the ones who are likely to have gotten the infection and to spread it to other people. So for now, for every case identified, uh, we are looking for the people who have been in contact with that person and do the test. Uh, that said, the government is also doing some level of community testing as the um, space allow, you know, as funding comes in. Um, as we wait and see, of course, if there's funding, then community testing will be done as we go along. The other tests which are still undergoing study as we said, molecular tests are, very, are quite expensive, but um, there is, it's the best available right now. There are other tests, like, you know, the HIV test, which we normally do, which we look for antibodies, which is antibodies against the infection. So there is a test which has been developed looking at antibodies against the infection, uh, and it's been approved by the FDA to be, to be used by only specific in America, uh, which have been validated to use it. Uh, but they are using it, for example, in patients who are symptomatic and then this PCR is negative. For some cases, it's been shown to, uh, to help in improving the diagnosis. Uh, but then again, the antibodies don't rise until say, around 10 days. So, and it's mostly useful to tell us whether someone has had a past infection. Because the timeline at which we can be able to tell someone has had an acute infection, sometimes they are not symptomatic. And by the time they are symptomatic, the specific antibody that tells us whether someone has just gotten the infection starts to come down as they start developing immunity. So we can only be able to tell if someone has developed a past infection. That said, these tests are being improved to aid in 
diagnosing the acute infection, but for now they can only be used together with the PCRs. As we go ahead, you know, um, they will be used for community testing, to be able to ask how many people have gotten the infection and actually managed it. Uh, this test will also be able to tell us long term, are we developing full sustainable immunity to the coronavirus, which currently we are not sure. Um, there are thoughts that people are developing immunity, but that has not been said yet, has not been known yet. But these antibody tests are the ones which will be able to guide us as the disease evolves. Uh, then there are also like the rapid test, you know, the small the HIV test you can do for yourself through a small risk without the blood having to be taken to the labs. There have been such tests which have been developed, but those have not been approved. So they are not, um, WHO has not recommended them for use yet. So management, so there are, I look at management in two respects. There is home management, and there is, then there is hospital management. So for now we recommend home management mild infections. And by mild infections, we mean people who are asymptomatic, and some of these will be identified through contact tracing. You know, when somebody with an infection, you know, given a list of the people they've been in contact with, once these people are tested and they are found to be positive, but they don't have any symptoms, or they have mild symptoms, where the mild symptoms are fever, cough, with or without muscle aches, but without dyspnea. Dyspnea is difficulty in breathing. So as long as someone does not have difficulty in breathing, um, they are basically stable, then you manage them the same way you manage a common cold. The difference, there is need for quarantine, the isolation, because you, know, you need to prevent these people from transmitting the virus to other people around them, which is why we are saying people go home, but stay even within their own homes, they isolate themselves. Uh, and while they are, they are also supposed to monitor for clinical deterioration, where one of the signs of deterioration is any difficulty in breathing or symptoms which, instead of improving, they start getting worse. And these people will need hospitalization. Anybody who from the onset uh, prevent, presents with difficulty in breathing or clinically unwell, the elderly who have other illnesses, you know, diabetes, hypertension, cancers, those require hospitalization. Those are considered as patients with severe infection. Uh, and one, the main thing is appropriate infection control. In the hospital, we give supportive care, that is oxygen, ventilatory support for respiratory distress syndrome if it's there, fluids for dehydration, we give painkillers, you know, to manage the fever and the pain. So basically for these infections, it's, it's a supportive care. Um, there's no medication that is currently approved. I know people have been hearing about and have been buying a hydroxychloroquine, but it's, um, the information we have now is from what we call observational studies and uh, case reports. And those are usually the, the lower level of evidence. Not to say that it's not good evidence, but to be able to approve any form of therapy for use going forward, what you need are clinical trials. And these are properly set clinical trials, which are testing patients on this treatment vis-a-vis -vis patients not on this treatment and looking at the two different groups and monitoring and even using different combinations to be able to tell which of these drugs can really be said to be working. So for now, there are many therapies which have been shown from observation just as people are trying, but there's none that is approved. So what is currently recommended is as we take care of patients, you're allowed to try some of the medications that have been shown to maybe work but um, we recommend now, even as you enroll patients, you're also enrolling them into a clinical trial so they, they can contribute to the database that is helping us to decide in the long term which medications can we say can be able to work for uh, COVID-19. 
So unfortunately, even with all the excitement, um, hydroxychloroquine is just one of the potential drugs, not a confirmed drug. There are many others, but none of them have been confirmed up until now. Uh, other investigational approaches, uh, one of the people, one of the questions you asked about were uh, vaccines, how far are we, are we anywhere close to deciding we have a vaccine? And there are many, many vaccine candidates going, being tested right now. The closest, which is about to undergo human studies, is in the uh, United States, but we cannot be able to tell anything about it as of, as of now. Vaccines take a while to go through all the processes, but of course, even these are pandemic, the processes are being fastened, but there's only so much you can do. So for now, no, we don't have any vaccine that we can say can work against COVID-19. Uh, there have been papers about BCG, which is the immunization we all get, especially in African countries, to prevent us from TB. And just a caution is that this BCG <coughs> immunization, even if we say it prevents us from TB, it's severe forms of TB. It doesn't mean if someone is um, given the vaccine, they will never develop TB. They will just likely not develop very severe form of TB. And uh, there have been a few papers here and there which have come out uh, trying to show that the BCG, people who've been vaccinated are least likely to uh, develop severe disease. But again, this is still observational. Uh, nothing that has been tested to confirm. What we know and have always known about the BCG vaccination is that it induces an immune response, which does not only work against the bacteria that causes TB, but this immune response can also extend to protect you against other bacterial and viral infections, but not to protect you 100%. So for now, how impactful it is in preventing us from uh, getting COVID is unknown. And as you can see, in Africa, we are already getting quite a, we have a number of patients now with COVID. And we do know, like in Kenya, almost every child, um, adult has received the BCG vaccination, but we are still getting cases. So this again is something that is still being studied, not confirmed. Now, prevention, the best way to prevent the illness, and not just this one, any infectious disease is to avoid being exposed to the infection in the first place. And that this is where all the precautions we are taking come in handy. Uh, then, of course, you cannot be able to prevent yourself 100%, but there are everyday preventive actions that you can take. For example, the hand washing, either with water or hand-based, uh, hand rub, soap, water. Then social distancing, which is about two feet of social distancing. You know, the closer you get to someone who has the infection, the more likely you are to get infected. As we know, the mode that is confirmed is droplets. We know droplets are heavy, so they quickly drop to the floor. Um, they are not able to go beyond uh, six feet, which is about two meters which is why we are advised to stay more than two meters. However, you know, with um, WHO has cautioned of the possibility of a transmission in the air, which means there might be a few small particles that hang in the air and don't drop to the floor. Uh, but what I'll say about this, when you look at the studies that looked at it, it it's not really from observational, it was, um, studies which were designed specifically to just see how these droplets um, are moving and staying in the air. So it was largely experimental, but we don't know exactly how is this happening in, you know, real life. So it's a caution and we all know that, you know, particles may then be remaining in the air for a bit longer uh, than just, you know, the few minutes where, you know, we'd say if we keep two, about six feet away, then you're completely safe. We don't know that. That is still something that's being studied. Then there are the personal protective equipment, which we need to use as needed, and we'll go a bit more into that. So we asked, you asked, part of the PPEs is masks, and one of the questions is, what are the masks for? Who should use it? Which masks should we use? And how should we use them? Uh, and what we know about masks is that 
they protect whoever is wearing them from airborne particles and from liquid uh, contaminating the face. And we'll go into each mask and who should wear them. Eh? Now, different countries are having different policies on the use of masks. Uh, and, you know, the decision to use masks even in public places is fast because there are these thoughts that, you know, it's not only droplets, but it could be airborne. Then let's face it, in countries like our own, where social distancing may not be too, may not work too well, people still have to go to markets, people have to use uh, public transport means, then you might want to encourage them to wear masks. Um, so for now, every country is coming up with its own policies. WHO has its own policies and of course has allowed the various countries to come up with their own policies. But what you need to know is that, you know, there are people who are asymptomatic, who are transmitting, and you may meet these people in areas where you might not be able to maintain the social distance of six feet. And these same people may be transmitting without knowing that they are transmitting. So it's both when you wear your mask, it's to protect other people in case you're infected and you're not aware, as well as to protect yourself. Okay, so before putting on a mask, we need to all wash our hands, preferably with water or with alcohol-based hand rub if we don't have the water. Then ensure that you cover your mouth uh, with the mask, making sure that there is no gap, there is no space left. Then once the mask is on, avoid keeping on touching the mask. Of course, we must ensure both the mouth and the nose are covered. Eh? I'm sure as you've walked around in public, you've seen people walking around with their masks hanging below the nose. So it's, it's not achieving its purpose when it's hanging. Eh? Or when it's the same mask, you keep on touching and covering the nose and then putting it down. Uh, it's recommended that you replace the mask with a new one as soon as it's damp. The masks we are having are single use masks, so they need to be disposed of, but we'll go more into the masks in the next slides. Uh, when removing the slides, it's recommended that you touch the mask from behind, behind the ear. You're not supposed to touch the mask at the front because then you're contaminating yourself. So touch, remove from the ears. If you have a plastic bag, put in it and throw it and then wash your hands either with water or with a hand rub. So I'll go into the various masks that we have. And you've seen now uh, cloth face masks have gained popularity, not just here, but everywhere else, uh, which have been designed by tailors, even bandanas. And what CDC is now recommending is that cloth face covering should be used by the general public. Uh, we do know that the surgical masks and the N95 masks are becoming less and less. And we are trying to reserve these for the frontline healthcare workers, anybody who is handling patients, because we know that the cloth face, uh, the healthcare workers are coming into contact with people who are actually severely ill, more likely to infect them. So we can't expect them to wear their cloth face covers. So for now, CDC and WHO are recommending that people in the public can wear this. Uh, mostly to protect each other because as we've said, the infection can be transmitted even by asymptomatic uh, people. So they can be worn in public settings where we know we can't maintain social distancing in areas of significant community-based transmission and it will help the people who have the virus and don't know so from transmitting. Then there are the surgical masks and I've provided the picture there for us to know the difference. These help to block large particles. Of course, they are better than the cloth masks. Uh, and the cloth masks will vary depending on how they've been made. But when you go to the WHO sites, they've provided guidance for developing the cloth masks, ideally with layers of cloth, not just one layer, for it to be protective. So the surgical masks are already designed to block large uh, particle droplets, flashes, and sprays or any splatter that may contain germs. Uh, they help reduce the exposure of now your saliva, the person who is wearing and secretions, they'll protect you from infecting others through your secretions. And they'll also protect you from the secretions from other people. 
But of course, you must remember if secretions get into your eyes, then you're still at risk. So it's important to still keep the distance we are talking about. Eh? Uh, of note is that it doesn't filter or block very small uh, particles. So if the virus is contained in the very small particles, then someone can still potentially get infected, if, especially if it's a high um, load of the virus from someone who's very infectious, uh, which is why as we go along, we'll notice that for healthcare workers dealing with high, very highly infectious patients, we also recommend they, they wear the N95 mask. Uh, it doesn't completely protect because of the loose fit. And this is in comparison with the N95 mask. You know, I'm sure and you know and you've worn them, you can tell you're not, it's not completely fitting. There is still some space. So someone can still get infected, but it still protects. Uh, and ideally, these surgical masks are supposed to be used only once. So the habit people are having of recycling, it's supposed to be a once use. The moment it get mo gets moist, one is supposed to remove it. So you're not supposed to remove it, put it in your pocket or in your handbag and then put it on back. Eh? Remember, as you continue handling it, you're touching it, you put it in your pocket, uh, you're putting the organisms into your pocket and you're likely to reinfect yourself over and over again. So once you use it once, dispose it off and use another one for the next incident. Then there are the N95 masks. Uh, these are not for use by the general public, uh, according to the current CDC directive, nor to be mean just that they are critical supplies which are now reserved for healthcare workers. We do know that there are not too many available now, and this is where you know, engineers come in, in trying to help design and facilitate the production of more and more N95 masks. Um, there are also N95 masks, which I'm sure as engineers, uh, you know that, which are used in industrial settings. Uh, so not to say that they are just for healthcare workers, but in industrial settings, you might need the N95, especially where people are working in very dusty environments, not to protect them just from corona, but also from the dust and the effects of the dust. And as you know, um, coronavirus is worse amongst people with chronic illnesses and one of the illnesses is, is chronic lung disease which can come because of working in envir environments which are very dusty so it's important that engineers also know that in their work environments depending on what kind of work they are doing it may be important to wear the n95 mask because for them if they get the infections with the complications of being exposed to heavy dust then they are more likely to have worse outcomes so N95, it's called 95 because it blocks 95% of very small particles from getting in. Uh, this tells you there's still a 5% chance of someone getting infection from very small particles. Again, they're also intended for single use when using them in the healthcare worker setting. I know a lot of people have been thinking you can use them endlessly. Eh? But then... Um, we are now looking into the whole idea of extended use, reuse, and decontamination. And this we have learned from TB. Although TB is one of the infections where we've learned you can actually use it, the, the mask extensively because the microorganisms are not that efficiently transmitted. But then remember, COVID is an evolving illness. We are first not sure how it's being transmitted. We don't know how long the particles are staying. So if someone has the N95 mask and they have had it and um, they've met with a patient who's been infected, then using it again can be risky. So then what we are thinking is, what can we do uh, given the shortage? Because then these are expensive masks. We can't keep throwing them away. And some of the things we are doing in the hospitals is, to wear the N95 mask, but then on top of it, wear the surgical mask. So then once, you know, you can remove the surgical mask and dispose it off, but you're able to use the N95 mask for a bit longer. By extended use, what I mean is the mask I wear in the morning, the one I'll wear the whole day. So I'll see several patients uh, and especially wear um, it's recommended where you're dealing with a number of patients all with the same infection. For example, in this case, if I'm working in a ward with COVID patients, then you know all the patients have COVID. So I can use the same mask 
moving from one patient to the other to the other and use it through the course of the day. Reuse is where the same mask I use today, I'll also use it tomorrow. Which is what we do a lot when we are managing patients with a TB, like multi-drug resistance TB. We are able to reuse this mask over maybe four days or something. Um, but that's because the organism is not, doesn't, um, is not transmitted that easily. Uh, but then the question is, can we then do the same with COVID? And that's not clear. So we are just looking at the various ways of ensuring we can reuse, which you know, includes using the surgical mask on top. Then there are decontamination, and this is um, an area where engineers can plug in uh, to see how we can have masks that we can decontaminate. And then what measures can, how can we decontaminate these masks so that we can use them for extended periods of time? So I know I've talked about what role you guys can play as you are going along, but uh, just a bit. In the area of water and sanitation, and I was happy that at the beginning during the introduction, you mentioned that you're doing something towards this. We know in our setup that a lot of the areas don't even have running water. So as engineers, how can, we be in, in, how can you be innovative to help with this? Um, um, in the long term, maybe uh, think about, and I, I possibly think you guys are involved in this, in setting minimum standards for sewerage systems, um, where we know a lot of places which were supposed to just have a simple house are now you know, coming up with flats. Uh, is that area assessed enough to see what kind of sewerage system and um, water system should be provided to that area? So that's something to think about. Then there's the issue of designing of hand washing points in public places. That has been largely ignored. If any of you have been to Kenyatta lately, although it, it, it wasn't set up because of COVID, it was a nice coincidence that um, now when you get in into the hospital from either side, either the um, accident and emergency side or from the university side, at the entrance, a few meters, what you meet is a big area, a big hand washing area with about 10 or so taps, which makes a big difference when you're coming in and out of a hospital. Um, and we think this should happen in all public places because, again, when we think of sanitizers in public places, it will be costly, they will be stolen, they will disappear. So these are thoughts as engineers, as we are thinking of public places, malls, can we start thinking of hand washing areas in the parking lots at the entrances? Um, then what can we advise about recycling of water? We know now know most of the smaller businesses, everyone has been forced to have a place for washing hands from, but the water is limited. So can we start thinking about how some of this water can be recycled, perhaps? Uh, then for PPEs, uh, personal protective equipment, we've talked about the N95 masks, and I was happy that at the beginning you said you're putting resources together to make things available to healthcare workers. So there is urgent need of having more N95 masks. I don't think we have to keep importing, I think we have the capacity to produce them here, especially those with the respirators attached, which will help. Then there are the, sorry, there is a spelling mistake, there are Googles. Uh, the current Googles we are using in the hospitals, the way they are designed makes reusing them quite difficult. They are well done for aesthetic purposes, beautiful, but they have a cloth around it, the area that covers the eyes. Uh, which works well when we don't have a pandemic. But during these times of a pandemic with limited resources, we want to have things that we can recycle. And with this, we can't, it becomes a bit hard to recycle, especially when you decontaminate because the area with the cloth doesn't dry. So we might want to look at Google, which we can redesign. Do we want to use a rubber material? Can we look at ways of decontaminating without necessarily making them wet and losing time as they dry. Then there are the coveralls, the plastic um, clothing that we are wearing while going into the uh, um, isolation wards to see patients. And it's been surprising that what we are seeing that most of them are poor in quality. They look nice and white, but then they are not waterproof, but they are marketed as waterproof. 
So this is an area to also look into to ensure that what is in circulation is waterproof um, to protect the healthcare workers. Uh, then screening, in terms of screening, somebody mentioned about fumigation and yes, this is something we, we think should uh, be taken up where we should have fumigation happening in markets. And again, sorry, there's a spelling error there. So as people get into markets, we might want to go a step further, you know, instead of just telling them to use PPEs, can we go a step further and do fumigation at entrances, fumigation at entrances into malls, public transport, uh, this is something we can look into as a country. Now in hospitals, how can, what role can engineering play? And here I've just put a few of my thoughts. Uh, can we think, and I think a few people are thinking about this, developing jackets and these are jackets that patients can wear if any of you have been to an icu you know there are all these monitors we put on a patient to be able to tell how the patient is doing so but can we have a jacket which a patient wears and this is monitoring the lung movements um, so that the doctor does not have to keep coming and using their stethoscope getting contaminated but with, with this jacket, which is connected to a monitor, we can be able to tell how the chest is doing. Is, is the patient breathing properly? Are there any added sounds in the lungs that could indicate deterioration or improvement? So these are things to think about in terms of research and designing. Then observational TV. When I say observational TV, I mean like the monitors you see in ICU, which are very costly, which is why you see them in um, ICUs only. But can we think of designing something simpler that can be used as simple as every bedside in the wards, in these isolation wards, uh, and they can be able to monitor the patient um, and let us know how the patient is doing, even as we think of ventilators. Uh, then there's design, uh, designing of isolation wards that are multi-purpose. Uh, the reason I say this is, we can't go around designing permanent isolation wards in all the hospitals because it's not like we know the last pandemic was many, many years ago. So if we have all these resources, we have an isolation ward that uh, is completely well equipped. What do we do with those resources once the pandemic is over? Uh, and what we are recommending is, could we um, use the expertise of engineers to design isolation wards that are multi-purpose in that once the pandemic is over, these same isolation wards can be converted and they can be converted back into either an ICU, a HDU, a theater, a ward as the need arises. And for this, it's to think of low cost laminar flow technique. And laminar flow technique is where I'm saying, um, what we know about isolation wards is where we have negative pressure with air flowing one way but not coming back in. Uh, but now we need to think of laminar flow where we can have air flowing both in and out, but the, the out is to facilitate the, the, out, the flow of air from very heavy droplets. Like in corona, we know we are saying that transmission is through droplets and these particles don't stay in the air for long. So can we design a way that, you know, there's a suction to pull out these droplets that are dropping and such facilities can be used not just as an isolation ward, but they can then be converted into a normal ward. They can be converted into an ICU once the pandemic is over. They can be converted into theaters, you know, with um, specific monitoring for patients, even by the bedside. So those are just thoughts to think about. Uh, then other areas um, have talked about decontamination and these of the goggles we are using and 95 masks, some of the clothes we are using. Some of the things that are being look, looked into is the use of UV radiation, uh, hydrogen peroxide, use of moist heat, microwave generated heat. Again, all these things I'm listing here are things that people are thinking of. Um, so these are active areas of research that you know, we can collaborate and just see what are low cost methods we can use in our country to decontaminate. You know, rather than focus on just manufacturing, we can manufacture, but then 
be able to discontaminate so that we can use them for extended periods of time because we don't know how long these will last. Uh, then lastly, somebody who said, you know, to just talk about mental health and there are many, many concerns. These are just a few of the concerns I have put here. And there are concerns about how someone needs to protect themselves. Um, people are concerned about disruption of services. How will they get do their shopping? You know, what if things finish? How will they survive? If the markets are closed, how will they buy the perishables? Then there's the whole is issue of isolation. Uh, like one of you said, nobody wants to sneeze anymore. Because when you sneeze, you don't know, do you have corona or what infection do you have? Then there's guilt over not being able to take care of our loved ones. Guilt during Easter, people not being able to go and visit their loved ones. Then there's the stigma that's now being associated with um, COVID. People are starting to stigmatize anybody who has COVID. Or when someone coughs in a public place and people look at them and they walk away. So there's that stigma also that's causing you know, mental health um, issues. And uh, maybe you might have seen this in social media, but I just thought to put it there for us to think what we want to be during this COVID period. Uh, I'm hoping most of us have come away out of the fear zone. Uh, we are, some are still in the learning zone, but now we need to be in the zone where we are thinking of solutions. And I think that's how this team has been formed because you want to see, okay, we are engineers, but then what can we do to help with this? So, we encourage people to now move from the fear zone to the learning zone. Let's be innovative and start looking for solutions. Uh, now, that said, so there are a few ways to cope with stress. And this is, there's a whole write-up recommendation from the CDC. There are the basic things we know, but uh, we need to take them more, uh, to take them more seriously. Uh, take a break from watching, reading, or listening to new stories. Uh, a lot of people are getting the information from social media and uh, social media has very scary things that it says in there. So I think we also need to reach a place where we decide now, this is my boundary. Um, I'm not going to listen. I, I'll need to listen to information from credible sources and believe that things are being done to control it. Eh? Then take care of yourself, exercise, eating well, get enough sleep, avoid alcohol. There's a temptation to drink either to numb or the idleness. Some people are not at work. Uh, people have lost jobs. So, but what we recommend is please just take care of your body, avoid alcohol and all the other drugs. Then make time to unwind doing the things you like and connect with others, even if not in person, phones, share what you feel with people that you trust. So that's all for now. I know there was a lot more from the Q&A um, and we can address that as we go along. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ari. I know that uh, it has been wonderful for members to, to get uh, to know that. Uh, they should not worry and there's, uh, there's hope along the way. So it's uh, question time. I would like to... Uh, bring in uh, engineer Grace Kangundo. Maybe she can ask a question or two and then we go to Diana. Engineer, your mic is off. Uh, you, uh, kindly check, check, check your mic setting, uh, then let's go to Diana. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm actually gonna ask a question on behalf of someone who messaged me privately. He asked, what are the underlying health conditions? Uh, Dr. Lillian, in your, convert, in your yes. address, there are sometimes you'd say mm -hmm. underlying health conditions. And uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Stomach infection affect my immunity to COVID-19. And I will add to that. And Sorry, can I ask infection? Yes. Sorry, just ask that. What are the underlying condition, conditions? And then? So yeah, like else you asked. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Infection, mm -hmm. right. and I would love to uh -huh. add, yeah, to add on the, on his question, and also ask like, when you have issues of the chest, like bronchitis, does it also affect your immunity mm -hmm. to that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
you want to respond to that then we move to the next one yes okay so for now we are going by you know what we have found on the ground and uh, patients who've been found to do us are patients with um, high blood pressure uh, diabetes and those two usually end up coming together chronic lung disease and chronic lung disease can be due to smoking cancers uh, then you know if someone has bronchitis if it's well controlled maybe not there hasn't been any specific link to people with bronchitis necessarily doing any worse eh? uh, but those are the main malignant cancers uh, there's a caution on that and then there's a caution this has not been found but there's a caution for anybody with any illness which can cause the immunity to be low for reason. yeah um, and when we say that, we haven't pointed out to anything. I know there have been a lot of questions uh, from people living with HIV where they are asking, am I you know, more likely to do worse with um, this illness? And since we haven't had any necessarily any worse outcome with HIV, what we are asking people is to be cautious, especially those who have not taken their treatment well and so their immunity is low. But for people living with HIV who have been taking their medication well and uh, their immunity is good, then they really don't have anything to worry about. Uh, but then we'll be able to tell more now. We know HIV is more rampant in Africa as opposed to the countries which have now reported more cases. Eh? So as we go on now is when we'll be able to really tell the impact. But as of now, even looking at what's happening in Kenya, we haven't seen any increase amongst these people yeah i hope that has answered Diana? okay uh, I, I think she's answered and I, I i i had a question uh earlier on during the course of the week as i was reading i read something to do with the mm -hmm. the vaccine there's there's there there have been some tests going around and there's uh, mm -hmm. there, are, there are people who are asking, uh, how is it uh, is the disease related uh, affecting asthmatic people? Secondly, uh, how is the vaccine? They are saying there's, there's some mm -hmm. there is some doubt with the, it is reacting or rather uh, can cause autism. Uh, maybe you can uh, chip in on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's all? Yes. Okay. So with asthma, again, I'll just say that asthma is um, an illness that leads to compromised lung function. So, and, and that makes it, it's a chronic lung illness, but then there are people who have asthma and they are well controlled. Uh, but then we do know that asthma gets um, it gets worse when somebody gets another infection. In fact, most asthmatics get an asthmatic attack because either they have a viral infection or they've gotten a bacterial infection or they are exposed to dust. So looking at the studies which have been done, looking at chronic conditions, we haven't had any obvious increase amongst asthmatics. Yeah, um, it's mostly elderly with all those other comorbid, but then it's also one of those illnesses you'd want someone to be cautious because we know that asthma affects the lungs. And then depending on um, how someone is, if your lung function, you have asthma, but then your lung function is not compromised, your lung, your ability, your lung capacity, how your lung is able to respond feel good enough, then someone is not going to necessarily have a worse outcome. But then the asthmatics whose lung capacity is already compromised. In that case, then they would have to be more cautious. Uh, vaccines and autism. Um, first, it's to say, to point out, I know the issue of vaccines and autism came from the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, and that's something that has 
gone on for a number of years, in fact, leading to a decrease in the uptake of the vaccine, mostly in the Western countries. Uh, and what resulted is that now there have been outbreaks of measles in countries which had even controlled measles. Um, and this came from a publication which was done, and um, a lot has gone on around this publication, which was even pulled down because there were found to be many flaws in how this work was done. Eh? Uh, but the problem is when we spread such information, it stays with people for a while. So I wouldn't say that the current vaccine will cause autism, because even the MMR vaccine has not really been proven to cause autism. Uh, but then again, it's not been put out there for you, so we don't know what the impact will have. Like, you know, all, before anything is used, it has to go through various trials, you know, even before it goes to the point of human testing. Uh, so up until now, we can't be able to tell even how good the vaccine will be once it's out. We know the HIV vaccine, we've been going around in circles for a number of years now, so we also don't know how we'll, what we'll get from the COVID um, vaccine and what the side effect will be. All right, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I think Engineer Munane has a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, Engineer? Okay. Yes, uh, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dr. Lillian. Uh, my question is, um, I had on a, on, a, on a media interview of a senior official in the ministry saying that sometimes there could be dynamics mm -hmm. depending on the race as far as... Um, sometimes there could be? Dynamics depending on the race. Uh -huh. As far as uh, COVID, uh -huh. COVID yes. is concerned, mm -hmm. I don't know from a medical point of view what mm -hmm. is your thought on that. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Uh, yes, you know, all illnesses. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just complete. Thank you. I think he's done okay. with the question. Yeah, so you're done. Okay. So he does have a point. Um, right now, we are not able to tell whether how we respond uh, as Africans, as Kenyans, is any different from how other people will respond. But yes, disease response is, is there are a number of factors that can determine how someone behaves when they have an infection or they have any other illness. And genetic, our genetic makeup plays a big role. So when looking at the effect of a disease, you look at both the organism that is causing it. And when you're looking at the organism, we are looking at how infectious is it. Like when we compare these um, COVID-19 with the previous SARS, what we are seeing is that it's, um, this is more infectious. You know, it's infecting people at a higher frequency than the SARS or the MERS. And that's a factor of the virus itself and how it behaves. But then there's the other aspect to look at, the, the host, the person it is infecting, how will they respond? And how we respond will be affected by various factors. One can be our genetic makeup. As we are seeing now, the older people are responding worse than the younger people. Uh, then there are other illnesses we may have. So yes, our genetic makeup does play a role amongst many other uh, things that may also have an effect. Uh, so for now, we don't know, but really as we are seeing, uh, we thought initially Africa wasn't going to get any case, but now here we are, and the cases are on the rise, you know, just like in all the other countries. Although, as we can see, the spread is not as rapid as, for example, in Italy, but then again, that can be explained. First, as Africa, we've dealt with um, outbreaks before, the Ebola outbreaks. That's just one factor. The other thing is we've got an infection much later. So we've had the advantage of learning from China, from the US, from Italy. So, for example, when we look at Kenya, we, you know, from early on, although some people might think we should have done it earlier, but the response to, you know, close entry and start the social distancing from the time the first case has helped might have played a role in just flattening this curve. 
So there are many factors when it comes to disease spread and control, there are many factors which can you know, have an effect and the host is one of those. And when we look at the host, we're also looking at the genetic makeup of the person. That answers? Yes, engineer. Uh, yes, Doctor, that is uh, answered. Uh, okay. We have a question okay. from Patrick Njeru. Uh, let's be let's be brief because we have we have a few minutes to to finish. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick. Yes, my name is Patrick. Yes, uh, um, your question, please. Can you hear me? Uh, it's unfortunate that. Uh, uh, this thing caught us up uh, some of us when we are in a, an assignment outside the country and could not catch up with the last bridge to the country. My question is from mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Ray's point of view. How, how long are we expecting this to head and that we can be united with our families and back to the country? Because there's some of us were caught unaware mm -hmm. that we could not manage to come back to the country. You can imagine the scenario. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that, that's unfortunate. I can imagine how difficult it is. And um, of course, the response I'm going to give is not even going to be that encouraging in that we don't know. We don't know how long the lockdown needs to be. Uh, I don't think it's malicious when the authorities say a lockdown of a week and then extend it by two weeks. No, it's one of those things you just have to keep seeing how things are evolving. Uh, because we also know that we may just act prematurely and ease the mechanism we put in place, and then before we know it, there's another spike. And these are diseases we are studying as we go along. Um, the information I've given you, a lot of it might have changed one month from today. One year from today, we will look back and we will understand uh, COVID-19 very differently from how we understand it now. Uh, one week ago, we were saying our mortality, I think, was at around 3%. When I calculated today, it had gone up to six, around 6%, the number of patients who have died, with the denominator being the total population who are infected. So we don't know how it's going to evolve. We don't know whether we'll reach a point where now that people will develop immunity and we'll stop being, getting the infection. We really don't know that. Uh, so in terms of how long it will take for this to be eased, for people to be able to travel back and forth, it's not very clear to anybody. It could be three weeks, it could be a month, it could be two months. Yeah, that's, that's the unfortunate bit. Okay, so uh, the, the other question I had is, you, you talked about uh, human pet, pet human, uh, transmission yeah. mm -hmm. how, how are we mm -hmm. faring in that in that manner is there any statistics showing that there have been transmission to animals and uh, how what is that uh, putting kenya generally risk wise okay so the information that's available is not from kenya uh, we don't have any information on tra transmission within kenya from pets animal uh, but from out there, that's where a few of the studies that I've looked at have shown that there is human to pet transmission, mostly human to cat transmission. And uh, what they saw is that cats are showing symptoms once they get infected, but there hasn't been anything to show that the cats can infect humans. There has also been evidence uh, of human to dog transmission both actual transmission and experimental because then what people are going ahead to do is to actually try and infect the cats the dogs with the virus and see whether they are getting infected so after seeing this evidence of human to cat then people have gone ahead to try and do experiments and see whether these animals are actually getting infected and what was seen is that yes they were getting infected cats and dogs uh, some of the others, like poultry, cows, it's not been shown that they are getting infected by the COVID. Uh, so the precaution now by WHO CDC is that people who are infected should then find ways of protecting their pets, mostly the cats and the dogs, which now there is evidence of that. So uh, generally, mm -hmm. 
uh, how is our curve doing? Are we seeing a scenario where we are going already reaching the plateau, the table, or we are still having a, an exponential climb? To be honest, it's not as rapid. I'm sure as you look, it seems like it was kind of going to flatten. It's not as exponential as it is in, for example, Italy and all the other places. Eh? Yeah. But then we also need to remember, um, first, we are not doing community testing to that big extent. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's possible that the cases we have are much more than the ones we are reporting. But then it also means that if there are much more, then it's people who are out there and they're okay, they're asymptomatic, but remember they can continue transmitting. But as of now, what it, see, it means is that it's not as rapid as in a lot of other places. Uh, if we look at the trend, South Africa too, and if we think we might go along the same trend, um, they also seem to be controlling the epidemic with all the measures that they have taken. Uh, the fact that the lockdowns came early means we have delayed, you know, we've, we've made our curve to flatten a little earlier than it would have. But then there's the possibility of an exponential increase if we ease the measures that we have put in place. And that is what we don't know. We don't know. Are, are, are we seeming to reach a point where the curve is not going so exponentially because of the measures we have put in place? If we ease the measures, what will happen? Yes. There's a chance okay. that... May, may I ask mm -hmm. a question? Yes. Uh, I would like to know, I, um, I don't know whether you touched on it, or I may have missed it. What is the relationship mm -hmm. between uh, the COVID-19 and the 5G? Because mm -hmm. there's been a lot of speculation about, uh, about that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes, there has been a lot of speculation. I've seen that on social media. Uh, scientifically, I don't see any relation. Um, it's, it's clear this is a virus that has been isolated. The genetic material has been traced. It's been identified with a previous virus. So, you know, there's link to a virus that infects bats. So I don't see what the scientific connection between this and 5G is. Um, yeah, for now, I, I will just say it's a speculation. Okay, so perhaps mm -hmm. it's just a, co it's a coincidence that there's some harm coming through from the 5G, but uh, the correlation is not necessarily uh, proven. Engineer, yeah, I don't think they, mm -hmm. engineer, engineer, from an engineering point of view, there is no correlation yes. so far. We know that there's even electromagnetic effect can have, always have effect on people. Yes. But, but the That's threshold true. is very minimal. The, until we get the proof for such particular mm -hmm. uh, uh, thinking, we cannot say for sure mm -hmm. that 5G is related. Right now, this disease mm -hmm. is uh, totally not related to technology mm -hmm. so far. Unless it, unless yeah. unless doctors can say this is a manufactured thing in the laboratories. Yeah, because you see, it's clear it's an infection, and like you've said, there's usually correlation in that things like five G X rays, different rays will cause cell mutations, mm -hmm. and the cell mutations will be seen in your cells, your DNA. Your DNA will be transformed into something that it was not, and that's how cancers develop. When something occupies a place it wasn't to occupy in your body, and this can be, you know, it's, this change can become because of the rays, 5G, I don't know, we can speculate. Even viruses can lead to cancers, and that's because some viruses get into your body and occupy space where your DNA is, and they make now your cells to multiply in, the, in a, a normal way, they were, in a way they were not supposed to multiply. So in future, we might see some correlation of 5G with other things, other changes in our body, but as of now, this is an infection. Yes. The yes. virus has been confirmed to be there. <clears throat> okay. Thank, thank, thank you for that, Dr. Tari. There's a question again here. Uh, mm -hmm. Are the numbers mm -hmm. that the government is giving correlating with the, 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 the picture on the ground? Uh, when we talk about the picture on the ground, we are talking about the patients in hospitals. I suppose that's what you mean, the ground. Eh? 
Yeah, because so far we are not do, we are not doing um, large scale community testing. Yeah, right now we are not doing large scale community testing one, um, but it seems the numbers that they are giving seem to correlate with the numbers on the ground, uh, the kind of patients we are seeing. There's a correlation. I, mm. I have no reason to doubt. The only thing I can say is that, like I've said before, it's a possibility the numbers are higher, but that's because we are not doing community testing. They are doing a good job of doing contact tracing. Um, again, we have learned from the HIV uh, epidemic where people learned contact tracing so this is not something that caught us unaware in terms of doing contact tracing uh, so that they, they've done quite a good job for the people who are symptomatic they are able to trace anybody they could have come into contact with yeah all right and, and then there's a question that i wanted you uh, as we are about to finish uh, there's there's this idea of how can you demonstrate to members how to wear a mask properly? Wearing and removing it. Because somehow I see people wearing here, removing it down, putting, leaving the nose mm -hmm. open and talking on the phone <laughs> and all that. So I don't know. If you have a mask, can you demonstrate uh -huh. to the public right now um, how to properly to mm -hmm. wear a one? Okay, let me check if I have a mask here with me. Although I hope you are able to see those pictures that I that I put up because they they, yeah. they demonstrate quite well, um, yes. and we can share. And they are also available on the WHO site. Yes. So but, this is. A, but you know, you know, for mm -hmm. us, for us, we believe by seeing. <laughs> you want to see? You don't want to see pictures. <laughs> All right. So I'll demonstrate. This is a surgical mask, mm -hmm. and and how to wear a surgical? Any mask will basically be the same. So you need to hold your mask like this. You can see clearly. Yes. Yeah. Not, not like this. So like this mask that I've held now, since I'm holding like this, I'll discard it. Mm -hmm. Now that I've used it for demonstration. Because my fingers have touched here. It means I've already made it that here. So ideally, you hold your mask like this. And then you wear like this. And mm -hmm. on the mask, you know, there is the upper part which has a... Um, a plastic thing that you can adjust depending on the shape of your nose. So that should always mm -hmm. be on top, not down. So you shouldn't wear it like this. Mm -hmm. So mine is on this side. This is the upper part. The smooth side is the lower part. And you hold it like this. You, come, you put like that. And mm -hmm. then for removing, first, this is not allowed. Because to do this, you're leaving your nose open. And idea, you're supposed to cover, I mean, you can't cover your eyes. Otherwise, if there was something that could cover eyes, and that's why some have a shield on them mm -hmm. to protect the eyes. Like we've said, the secretions come through both the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. So mm -hmm. you can get one with a shield. Either way, you just wear it the same, like that. And then when it's removing again, you hold it by the ear. You don't hold here to remove. You hold by the ear. Remove it. I normally just turn it around. If I have a plastic bag, I'll put it in. If I don't, then I'll just uh, throw in the nearest dustbin without touching this side. The inside. So, uh, yeah, at all costs, avoid touching anywhere, inside or outside. Just hold oh. here. Mm -hmm. Again, if you touch the outside, remember you've been protecting yourself. The outside is to protect yourself from people's secretions. Mm -hmm. The inside has your secretions. Yes. Yeah. And remember, it's not 100% that even these secretions don't pass in. They could have started seeping in slowly. Yeah? So yeah. if you touch here, you're contaminating yourself mm -hmm. all over again. So you hold here to both put on and to remove. And, and you uh, remove and throw <laughs> away. You don't remove but, keep it in your bag. Mm -hmm. OK, nice. But you have already touched Sorry? it when you're holding it here on, on your nose, huh? Uh, but you're holding it like this. Where no, you're not. You don't touch to fold. Yes, yeah. it fold folds it. itself. You just to adjust. You you hold here to adjust. Any adjustment is from the side. From the sides. Uh -huh. oh. you, you only when you do this, you're making it lie on the nose nicely. You just hold the side here. 
Mm -hmm. You get? Yes, I see. Because yeah, I've, been seeing, you, I've mm -hmm. been seeing people telling me that you're supposed to press the top part so that it can take the, 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 sh the shape of your nose. So that, especially if you have spectacles, mm -hmm. the mist does not go into your spectacles. Now, if you hold really, yeah. like this, if you get a mask and you hold like this, you can feel your, it's actually tightening around your nose without you having to start doing this. Because in the process of doing this, you'll end up even touching your, your eyes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the best thing is to adjust <clears throat> at the whole just below your eyes. And then when you're removing, just remove it from the sides. Mm -hmm. Avoid so, touching. Uh -huh. so, in case you want to adjust here, you know, when it's still clean and fresh and you're adjusting at the start, it's okay at the start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you feel that you need to, but it's still clean, so you can do this mm -hmm. and then just leave it. What you, do, you shouldn't do is you keep on touching, you keep on adjusting, because then you're touching everything that you've been protecting yourself from. In so which they, case, you've not helped yourself. So they go to your hands. They go okay. to your hands. And then you'll touch then your you face. Then you touch your eyes. The same way I'm doing now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've not helped yourself. You've wasted your, your, your time. You've made yourself struggle breathing and you've reinfected yourself all over again. Ah, so, and then, the, and then, and then, let me ask a question. Just, let me just, ask a question. Just a minute, engineer, engineer. Just a minute, okay. engineer. Then there is also an idea of uh, before wearing, you need to uh, disinfect your hands using some sanitizer. How is that? Does that help? Mm hmm. It does help. I think it's a good habit to form. The, the crucial thing, first remember it's like we've said, you might end up adjusting at your nose. So yes. it's important that your hands are sanitized so that whatever you might have touched, in case you touch your eyes, you're protecting yourself. Yeah. Then when you remove, you know, since you'll throw it, just in case you accidentally touch or the bean or something, it's good you sanitize your hands. But ideally try and avoid touching here. All right. Uh, all right. These uh, are not for using. All right, engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, Doctor, thank you for that. Uh, that engineer, you had a question. Uh, let's yeah, yeah, I had, a, I had a question which I had from my house help. And uh, uh -huh. the question was this must, if you get one, and if, if mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, uh, can you wash it with the Dettol and uh, you can use it again the next day? This one, the surgical yes. mask? Yes. No, no, no. This one is for disposing of. This what about the clothes? The clothes one? The, the clothes you can, in fact, you're supposed to wash and disinfect and reuse, the ones for clothes. Uh -huh. But these ones, the way they are designed, they are not for that. But even mm -hmm. with the cloth mask, the, you know, everyone needs to know that the how to handle is the same. You still hand like this in re putting on and removing. So the thing is to remove and to put it wherever you're going, the water, you're going to disinfect with whatever disinfectant without touching here. All right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Arif, Arif, Ali, you have a question, and I think this is the last question, then we allow Dr. E to go and attend to our people, because I know she is on the front, fr forefront. Arif? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ari. My question was uh, basically, I think, in two parts. I've been waiting for so long, I've even forgotten the first part, but uh, this is uh, basically on, uh, so for example, you know, you're just at home and you just start feeling some itchiness in your, in your throat and you start worrying. Uh, are there any, uh, you know, you, you forget that you can also get just the common flu and you deal with it at home. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So what, apart from the signs that we see or rather read on the, on, on the news and everything, what can we just who, you know, just uh, ignore and maybe just know that it's not uh, COVID-19. And uh, 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 what remedies are that at home we can, mm -hmm. we, we, we also read uh, gargling with hot water, salt, uh, hot mm -hmm. tea, uh, ginger and lemon. And you know, all these uh, mm -hmm. home, home uh, sort of remedies. Uh, and are mm -hmm. they true? Uh, you know, hula yeah. balu yeah, around. Mm -hmm. uh, so first, the symptoms for COVID are the ones I have said, but unfortunately, they are the same um, for other flus. <laughs> so it's possible you could have another flu that is not COVID. 
uh, and like what I've said about COVID is that one, if you get those symptoms, fever, uh, you could get a mild dry cough, uh, muscle aches. Again, those you get with any other flu. But then there are the signs of them getting severe. For example, if someone starts to feel it going to your chest and you're starting to have difficulty in breathing, then for that, whether it is a, a different virus or COVID, that is something you need to seek medical care for. Because the only way to know whether it is COVID or not is a lab test. So how to know whether to seek medical help is first, if you have symptoms and you know you come into contact with somebody who has COVID, then you need to go to hospital at least for the testing. And in the process of testing, you'll be told either it is COVID, but it is mild and mild means you can manage from home, get isolated or not. But if it's severe, then you need to be in a hospital. That's one. So you can't be able to tell whether it's COVID or another flu. And even in hospital, when we do those tests, if you find it's not COVID, we also take samples for other viruses so that you can be able to tell that, yes, this one is severely sick, but it's another virus, maybe influenza or another one and not COVID. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, when at home, um, the same remedies for common cold are the same ones for COVID. Basically, if you have a fever, manage the fever. And what is being recommended right now is Panadol. Uh, some of the other drugs, <laughs> there are thoughts that they could be worsened, but that, again, it's not proven. Eh? The other drugs I'm talking about, Brufen, Diclofenac, there are thoughts that they could be worsened, but it's not proven. So now we are saying avoid things like Brufen, Diclofenac, unless you are already on them for something else. Uh, okay. The other thing is in our rest exercise, ginger, garlic, yes, they have all, they do help to some extent. But remember, all these things are supportive. Eh? None of them are curing the virus. You're just supporting your symptoms as you give time for the virus to clear from the body. All right. I have a question here. I think this is related to those of us who wear spectacles. Um, mm -hmm. I wear spectacles and I get so foggy every time I wear the masks. How do I avoid this? I think it's how to wear the mask properly. And I, people who wear glasses like you and me can maybe, mm -hmm. you can give us an idea of how to adjust where so that they, <laughs> <laughs> I think you've answered that and how to adjust the nose part so that the air doesn't go up. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the adjusting how you wear in the nose part, but it can't help 100%. Eh? It's, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't take it away 100%, but it helps to some extent. Just the way you adjust the upper part, put it on the nose, but there is no guarantee that it will. Remember, this is not first an N95, mm -hmm. like, and we said that's one of the disadvantages of this. It doesn't provide complete seal, because like the N95 will seal here properly, so the fogging is less. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I know I've not really answered you or helped you that much, but just make an adjustment and then just, you, you, are, you learn to deal with it somehow. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a problem that I, I myself face because uh, in, in this cold weather, you go out, it's warm outside, it's cold outside, you mm. come back, it's warm and then the, everything is foggy and you're also having a mask. So it's, the fogginess is there. Yeah, yeah. And, and then it's new. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, it's new. It's only medical people who've been using this thing. So we've, um, we are not thinking about it that much. But for everybody else, it's completely new. So mm. yeah, the fogginess is there. You will just learn to deal with it, adjust properly at the top. And yeah, soon this will pass. And I thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ari. We, we had planned for one hour, but I can see we are going more than one hour. So at this moment, uh, maybe mm -hmm. I will, uh, if there's no burning question, I would uh, allow Dr. Ari to go uh, back to duties. Then engineers can also embark on the few recommendations from there. We can see what maybe uh, engineers can do. Yes, yes, I would like to say uh, maybe it's one or two things. Please do. Uh, yeah. Number but, one is to thank. Number one is to thank uh, Dr. Lilian Jaggi on behalf of IEK Council. Thank you very much for uh, finding time to uh, shed light on this uh, COVID-19 with the perspective of engineers. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, I can see the participants who are, who are not the number we, who had signed up. So uh, please uh, accept if we invite you again uh, for another mm -hmm. webinar in case 
in case the, 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 the need arises. I mm. hope you'll not mind that. Yeah, no, and, I'll not uh, mind like, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And at the same time, I would like to share with a few participants, I am seeing here there's a publication which has been released, Standards for mm -hmm. Management of uh, Construction Sites and uh, Welfare of Workers in Relation to COVID-19, uh, by mm -hmm. the, prepared by the National Construction Authority, NCA, in yeah. conjunction with the Ministry of Transport, yeah, yeah, Infrastructure Housing, and mm -hmm. Urban Development and Public Works. I think that will also give us, uh, for us in the construction sector, in the engineering sector, I'm sure mm -hmm. we'll also be able to get some very useful uh, reference material on how to protect uh, and how to manage those sites in the, in the era of uh, the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, that's what I would like to, to, to say. And I'd, I would also like to once again remind our listeners to support the IKCSR um, initiative. We are looking for funds, we are looking for technical assistance, so please go to our website, please uh, put in something, it doesn't matter how much you put in, it will make a difference uh, to what, uh, it will make a difference in fighting the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, we, as engineers, we will be, we'll have said that yes, we are we also stood to be counted uh, when the time, when the country had a crisis and uh, we were there to give our support. Uh, so other than that, I would like to invite if there's any other council member on the, on the webinar, I would like to invite them to uh, maybe say something as well. I'm not sure who we have. Uh, Engineer Guy. Yes? Engineer Guy. Okay. Yes, Engineer Guy. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, I think mine is to thank you so much, Dr. Tari. We really appreciate. I have learned a lot. And we will do our part as engineers to, uh, first of all, to live as responsible uh, citizens so that you on the front line are able to continue to protect life. We pray for you every day. We know it's not easy, especially you in the front line. And we really thank you for finding time to be with us. Thank you. All right, thank you too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for having me over. I'll be glad to come back again if you need. Like we've said, this is evolving. Mm -hmm. So the information we've shared today may be very different next week and the week after. So it's, it's an area we are all learning as we go along. So, and thank you for wanting to get involved. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So, thank you so much, Dr. Thank, thank, uh, thank I thank everybody for mm -hmm. their best and for making sure that we have this successful session. We were live here and we are also live on YouTube. So anybody who did not get it, I hope they got many people. Are, we are like, we had 100 viewers on YouTube uh, live. So maybe more people will get to know and learn more as we continue. So otherwise, Dr. Ari, nashukuru sana. Mungu wa kujalie. Okay, thank you very much. kumbele, ukumbele, ukumbele kabisa, lakini mola ako nanyi na jaribu ni muwezavyo. Sisi kama waandisi pia tajaribu uh, kadri ya uwezo wetu kwa saidia zaidi. Kwa sasa na washukuru na shukuru Diana uh, mwe na joni njemu. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye. Mm -hmm.